Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you've joined us. And you can always find us at goodlifetelevision.org, uh, where all the episodes, all the interviews, over 100 people from all walks of life over the last uh, couple of years that we've interviewed. Great stories, great people. Uh, I think you really enjoy it. And we also have what's called Power Clips, which is kind of some of the great moments from those interviews. So we invite you to join us at goodlifetelevision.org. In addition to all of our social media platforms, we, we know many of you are, and we're grateful. This program is presented by the Turner Foundation uh, here in Santa Barbara, California, where we're sitting. And you can find the Turner Foundation at theturnerfoundation.com, and you can kind of see what the Turner Foundation is all about. So I want to welcome my guest today. Adam McCaig is with me. Adam, welcome. Pleasure. Thank you. We've got some wildlife me. going on here, by the way, so these moths are going to be part of the program. It's beautiful. Yeah, life. Yes. Uh, Adam is, is a longtime Santa Barbara, I think sixth generation Santa Barbaran, uh, and has is, is been a big part of this community for a long time. He's been a, one of the top real estate agents, actually, in, in, this, in this town where we're sitting for the past couple of decades. And so real estate's, I, I guess, been your career. It has indeed. We'll talk about a lot of the other stuff in a minute, but talk a little bit about your your love for Santa Barbara growing up here and what that was like. Well, um, I'm actually a first generation on my side, but uh, my daughters are sixth generation. Okay. Um, and my love for Santa Barbara is deep. I, you know, again, born at St. Francis Hospital and went to local schools. And uh, what better way to... Um, have a career in a town that you love than a, a real estate. So right. I've really, really enjoyed it and helping our wonderful community find housing. Yeah. Which has been That's a rewarding rewarding. thing. Oh, huge, huge. Yeah. Lots of wonderful people and, um, you know, helping them in transitions of life, moving up, moving down, uh, uh, lateral moves. And uh, um, it, it's just a, a, a joy to help people. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And speaking of helping people, so I want to talk about kind of what's happening here because I think it's a great story and I think it's actually inspiring for people to hear about. I know you're not talking a lot about it, but I'd love to just hear a little bit about what's happened during the pandemic. As you said in, in some of the stuff I've been reading, real estate became a non-essential thing. Yeah. Uh, and so you, instead of just taking some time off, you went to work. Talk about what you did. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, as I was saying, um, you know, my job as a realtor is just helping people. And when it was deemed non-essential, I, you know, I was floored because I devote all my time to helping others and didn't know what to do with myself. So I posted on Facebook, uh, if there are any people at risk, uh, that need help in grocery shopping um, or picking up medication, let me know. And it, it was amazing. It created, it was a life of its own. Uh, I had response from many, many people needing that uh, assistance. And uh, what was more uh, inspiring were the people that wanted to help and volunteer. And it started off with three, five, 10, 20, 30, 50 people and we had an army of people um, wanting to help um, and we were doing that just grocery shopping and you know that was kind of challenging being that uh, the stores were so picked over um, we'd put together lists and go out from Goleta, Costco all the way to Oxnard picking up uh, uh, orders to uh, going to maybe six, seven, eight stores to fill one order. Um, wow. we, we took it real serious. We didn't uh, take any payment for it, no tips. Um, it was just a service that we offered. Um, and from there, it just grew even bigger and it's, it's still growing more today. Yeah, well, it's, still, it's now called Adam's Angels. Yeah. But yeah. What, what, what are you doing now? Uh, well, right now, um, well, on Monday nights, we, uh, uh, bag non-perishable groceries. We put together 300 bags each week and then we'll disperse that to seven locations throughout uh, uh, the community from Isla Vista all the way to Carpinteria. Um, and to date, uh, I think we've done over 15,000 um, of those in itself. 
On Thursdays, which is today, um, we will be in Alameda Park where we uh, uh, put out clothing, um, sleeping bags, uh, tents, uh, blankets, hygiene items, and we also uh, hand out the non-perishables. Um, we're there with uh, Santa Barbara Act, who does a, a hot meal. Um, we have Care for Paws that takes care of our uh, four-legged uh, uh, unsheltered, which is great. They've been a good partner. And Doctors Without Walls, they're caring for the, the medical needs of our uh, homeless. Wow. So. It's an amazing um, thing, I think, that happens in us when we, and I don't know if you've experienced this, I'm sure you have, but we think we're there to serve the other person, but in reality something happens that's so wonderful in us. Yes. When we get involved in that, is that has that been your experience? Oh, it's huge! It's huge, and that inspires me to do more. And we're we're always thinking of more um, that we can do to help our community. Uh, look for needs that are out there, and we do. We've helped uh, um, tried to help people get off the street, given people monies and tickets, uh, ways to get home. You know, sent someone to Colorado a couple of weeks ago. Really? Um, an unsheltered needed to go to see his sister in Sacramento. We provided a way for him to get there. Um, and the list goes on and on. Um, there's plenty to do, and I uh, encourage people to, um, you know, help at least one person a day um, and just be kind to each other, you know, yeah. bottom line. Yeah. Yeah. What was the response? So, you, in the pandemic part, I mean, you're delivering groceries, what, medicine or, I mean, mm -hmm. kind of essential stuff. Yeah. What was the, just the typical response, I mean, when you showed up at somebody's door with this? I mean, what, what are oh. they? Oh, in, in the beginning, um, you know, people were terrified, you know, fear of their lives, uh, you know, not knowing what uh, this uh, evil uh, COVID is. And, and they were so grateful because we were their only source of food. Um, and again, it was so heartwarming. A lot of these people um, had no family, no, and, you know, they're elderly and they're shut-ins. So, man, we, we were more determined than ever to help these, and we actually sought out people to help um, by word of mouth. Um, you know, heard of so and so that needs help, and she wouldn't ask for help normally, and we'd knock on their door and you know, give them a care package and and start a dialogue and help that way. So neat. It reminds me a little bit of the Bucket Brigade uh -huh. here in Santa Barbara where not necessarily a bunch of organization to it, but just some people who want to help. Yeah. You know, which it's interesting how sometimes these crises, and, and Santa Barbara's been through a lot, relatively speaking, I think, with natural disasters and, yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, the pandemic. But it's interesting how sometimes we can see the best of people in the worst times. Right. You've had, is there over a hundred? I was well over 200. Over 200 people? Yeah, yeah. And, and wow. people, you know, I had three people um, go to our website today uh, asking how they can help, so. So they're yeah. still coming? Oh yeah, yeah, in droves. I mean, we've got a virtual army of big hearted people that want to help uh, uh, mankind. Yeah. Yeah. How do so? If somebody's watching this and they want to join up, what's the website? Um, Adamsangels dot life. Uh, A D A M S A N G E L S uh, dot life. Adamsangels dot life. So yeah. people can still they can join you. Yeah. 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 And are you gonna keep this going? I mean, you... actually, <laughs> that, that's funny. I I thought uh, this would be something to do uh, for a couple of weeks or months, however long this uh, pandemic was going to last. But uh, the life of it that is created, it won't let me stop. And I, I really don't want it to stop. It's uh, a wonderful thing. Uh, we're self-funded. Um, we don't ask for money. You know, everything we need comes to us and we're able to help uh, without any government agencies. And it's just a loose um, group of uh, love, 
yeah. basically. Yeah. So, so for now, it's going to keep going. Yeah. 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 So what you know, I'm interested in, the, in this this homeless thing. And I've known about. I know Jeff Schaefer, and I've known about yeah. some of the work that goes on in the park for. It's actually, I guess, 15 or 20 years. Maybe they've been doing something, and they were at Pershing Park for a while. Mm -hmm. and then, but I think sometimes we see homelessness as a problem to be solved versus a person. Right. What What has been your, because I've seen some pictures of in, in here of you interacting with some of these friends without homes. How, how has that been for you, actually getting to know some of these folks versus, I think for a lot of people, it's a category. Right. You know, of, right. it's a, something we read about in the paper, it's this problem. Sure. What has it been like to kind of humanize it for you? You know, again, that's been uh, very rewarding and touching. Um, you know, everybody had a mother, everybody has a story, and to hear these stories are amazing. Um, nobody chose to be on the street, and these people would tell, tell me their plight, and, and I mean, it, it's heartbreaking, a lot of it. Um, and it makes, again, it makes me want to help that person individually or, um, uh, and collectively we try to help everybody. Um, but yeah, yeah, getting to know them is, is great. And sometimes, you know, all they want is a smile. Um, we walk past them uh, and I guess they're the invisible people. We try not to look, we walk past right. with, but if you just reach or look over, give them a smile, acknowledge them that they're human. I mean, that itself is uh, um, big. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, that's so, neat. so I have to ask about this other story just real quick because I think it's it's pretty cool. Just a little side oh, story. But what happened with the ring? Oh, that, that was <laughs> funny. Oh, oh. Um, I was at uh, the grocery store in Carpinteria and I uh, walk outside and I see this ring, a big ring, and I picked it up and my gosh, I, it looked like a, a real uh, antique ring. It was a huge diamond uh, or diamond looking uh, stone. And I thought somebody's gonna really miss this. I felt really bad that uh, someone's going to miss this, uh, what, what looked like an heirloom. So I went into the grocery store and uh, gave them my card and said, I found one fancy ring. Um, and then I went home and I put uh, um, an ad on Craigslist uh, saying I found a fancy ring uh, in carpentry in front of this store. And I got a couple of responses and um, they tried to describe the ring and it unfortunately was not uh, the, the owner uh, trying to obtain it. but. Uh, a couple of days later, I got a call from the manager, and she gave me the uh, gal's number who uh, uh, responded to losing it, and I called her, and uh, she described it perfectly, and it had been in her family for a hundred years, and she was about ready to give this two-carat diamond to her uh, granddaughter, and uh, wow. we reunited that uh, ring with uh, uh, its owner, and that was huge. That was a wonderful it's reward. She must have just been yeah over the moon. Yeah. Oh, oh, she was ecstatic. That's that so was great. Neat. This is you're like a real life Good Samaritan. Well, I find a lot of stuff, and um, <laughs> you find stuff. Oh, oh, I found wallets and purses, and when I see something out of the ordinary or where it shouldn't be, um, I will uh, you know turn around or pick it up and try to. Uh, find his home. What so. would be your thought, as people watch this program in lots of other cities, something like Adam's Angels, what if somebody wanted to do something like this in their city? I, I, I feel like it's a little bit of a example or model of mm -hmm. what can happen when it just takes one person, in this case it was you, sure. to decide I'm going to do something. But if, you, if somebody's watching this in another city and they're thinking, they're, they have a heart, they're wanting to do, they're bored, they want to do something, right. what would you say to them? Right, right. Um, actually, um, people have reached out and um, there is a, um, groups like 
our model um, in Chicago, um, in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, one of our um, uh, volunteers has family in Brazil, and they are so inspired by uh, his involvement with Adam's Angels that they started their own called uh, Night Angels in Brazil, and it's big. It's big. They go out at night and they um, clothe and they feed soup to the homeless, and they also have uh, doctors like like we do. Really? Um, and they're <laughs> they're probably over a hundred strong as well. And that that came up quick out of uh, um, from our group, but. What, what I recommend people do um, if they truly feel like they want to help the uh, homeless is bring a, a sleeping bag, bring a blanket, bring some food in your car um, and when you see um, uh, a homeless person that uh, resonates to them, you know, hand them a bag of food, hand them um, a blanket, uh, talk to them. So that's a start and there are churches and uh, other organizations that uh, would love to help grow their passion for uh, kindness. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, Oregon churches or yeah. faith-based communities, you know, when they see something like this going on, they probably really want to jump in and yeah. partner or help. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there's alignment there with, but it just takes somebody to step out and actually start doing it. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we, we have... Uh, um, many uh, uh, religious groups helping our uh, group on Thursdays and on Mondays. Uh, we have Father Larry uh, who joins us, who's just a delight. Uh, we have uh, many people from uh, uh, our Mormon church here and uh, um, you know, Katy Perry's parents uh, uh, oh, really join cute. us. Yeah, yeah. He, he's great and, and, uh, and Mary's awesome. So, so great. yeah, yeah. So great. Well, this is wonderful to hear about, inspiring, um, and congrats, Adams, Angels Life. If you want to join up, or if you're in another city and you're interested in doing something like this, we encourage you to do it. But congrats on what you've done, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time. This is Good Life TV. I'm Dean Wilson. We exist to inspire you, to encourage you, to educate, to empower. Go to goodlifetelevision.org right now. Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you're with us from all over the world. We're, we're so appreciative from wherever you are that you're joining us. You can always find us at goodlifetelevision.org where all of the interviews that we've We've had some great guests, great people from all walks of life, from all over the world, um, some great stories. So you can find them all at goodlifetelevision.org, along with what we call power clips. You can also find us on also all the social media platforms. I'm so grateful uh, to have my guest with me today uh, from Prison Fellowship Ministry. Um, James D'Amato and Audrey Fay are with me. Audrey is the regional director of the West Region and and James is director of field partner programs for Prison Fellowship. Welcome, you guys. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Prison Fellowship uh, was founded by Chuck Colson in 1976. It's been a very impactful ministry over decades, um, which I want to get to in a second. But I thought I'd start with kind of the situation. And, um, and, and James, maybe I'll start with you kind of give us a lay of the land for people who don't know about the the prison system at all the numbers the statistics the problem i guess as it as it were start by kind of laying out pretending that somebody knows nothing about the the situation you guys are trying to address give us a little bit of background and context Um, sure. Prison Fellowship is a um, faith-based um, prison ministry uh, where we go into, uh, and we have various uh, applications and programs uh, uh, within our organization, but primarily we go inside to uh, minister to men and women that are incarcerated uh, in various prisons across the U.S. 
Audrey, you want to add to some of the stuff that, that you're doing maybe with um, the academies? Sure. Um, so we have several programs that go on, but one of the one of the premier programs is our academy program where um, we are teaching individuals how to come to come out of prison and be good citizens. What does it mean to be a good citizen? And so um, we take them through about a 12 to 14 month program and we're teaching and talking to them about various ways that they can change their mindset to be restored and transformed. And that's really what we do in a nutshell. If you look at our, our mission statement, it's to restore those affected by crime and incarceration. That's our mission always. Um, whether it's inside the prisons, working with those that are incarcerated or also their families on the outside. Um, we we'll work with their families and their children to help build back that partnership between the parent and the child. It's very important to us to keep family relationships because we are faith-based centered. Right. And I was reading some of the numbers that, that the United States um, currently nearly 2.2 million individuals are incarcerated. Um, and it, and the, the, the statistics that, that I found, that we found through your website, uh, while more than 600,000 Americans are released from correctional facilities annually, two thirds are rearrested within three years. How does the work you, you guys do impact, combat that statistic? And, and how, what, what is kind of the vision that you have for, for um, working against this kind of vicious cycle that we see with incarceration? Well, one of the things that we do is we structure our academy curriculum and programming to address the criminogenic issues that typical um, inmates face and prisoners face. Um, and like, like Audrey said, it's uh, built around um, creating good citizens, whether they get paroled or stay in the prison. Um, and, you know, that's the goals. But there are different factors um, that we address and in, in, uh, highlight within, the, within our curriculum and our programming that, that works on those uh, issues, life skills, uh, substance abuse, um, you know, core, core, core issues that, that got them uh, inside in the first place, stuff like that. I think one thing that we do, well, that we've really started doing really well, and that's where um, James comes in, is that we started to partner with organizations that are located outside the prisons to build those partnerships that we can then take from our programs um, that they've been engaged with and graduate from into an organization that will work with them on the outside to really acclimate them into the community and get them time to really see what it's like to be a different person and walk in a different way and, and form different relationships. And it really works well when, when they go to an organization like who we partnered with just lately, um, Salvation Army. So when they partnership with those and they go to those programs that are six to 12 months long, it really helps further that um, space or not at all, the recidivism rate that happens. And that's one of the things I think that we're starting to really venture into. I know James probably talked a lot more about that, but I think that's what makes it even more profound with, especially what's going on in California with really rehabilitation being so prominent mm -hmm. um, and really being about how are we going to really help and make change with, with individuals who have addictive behaviors because that's a lot of incarceration. And yeah. so um, I think that's one thing we do really well and it's really, I think it's gonna pay off strongly um, in our future. Yeah, that's a strong point um, that she's making because we believe that uh, re-entry begins the first day they, they, they get inside. So, you know, the academy's built to help them, give them the tools and some uh, deal with issues that uh, won't, you know, reduce recidivism uh, rates getting back in by giving them some sound life skills and principles. One of the other things uh, that, that um, a, a lot of uh, parolees are faced with is substance abuse issues. And we've, we've have a national partnership with Celebrate Recovery um, which is an outside organization that was started at Saddleback Church. 
Mm -hmm. um, so what we do is we partner with them in putting actual Celebrate Recovery programming inside the academy, uh, as well as Celebrate Recovery has a lot of times their own programs running uh, in different areas of the, of the uh, institutions as well. But what we do there is um, the, the way we're training the leaders that when they get out of Celebrate Recovery, they'll have dealt with a lot of their, you know, substance abuse issues, anger issues, whatever hurts, habits, and hangups they have. And then they can immediately get linked to a Celebrate Recovery that's outside, which links them directly to a church. And that helps the reentry process as well. Wow. That's wonderful. I think everybody in the world could use Celebrate Recovery. <laughs> yeah, design, you know, everybody looks at it, at, at, you know, when they hear recovery, they think about drugs and alcohol, but Celebrate Recovery encompasses pretty much every hurt, habit, and hang up that's out there. So Yeah, it's, it's right. Built we're, all, we're all recovering from something. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Some of us have multiple issues, too. Right. And, and real quick, before I go on, can people volunteer? I mean, I'm assuming they can. If, if somebody wanted to get involved with prison fellowship and they said, oh, I'd love to, you know, serve in some way, how do they do that? So um, they can go to our website, prisonfellowship.org, click on volunteer, um, the button at the top, it's right there, very easy. It says click on volunteer. And then you can select the various departments that you would like to volunteer in. So it'll say in prison, we have an advocacy department. And so there's different ways that individuals that have a passion for helping the justice involved to be able to partner with us and volunteer. If it's prison, it'll go to one of my field directors in California, um, if they're in California, and then someone reaches out to them and contacts them, takes them through an application process. And then we also have a very in-depth training video lessons that we have them watch in order for them to get familiar with what it's like to go inside a prison. Wow. So that's the, so that's this, the, the way in is through the website. Yep. Talk for a minute about what you guys do with children. I, I was fascinated to read a little bit about the way you guys are impacting the, the children of incarcerated folks. Right. It that's seems to where, me that uh, one of the um, consequences, downsides, whatever, of, of incarceration is that it can then lead to another fatherless generation, fa you know, fatherless situation be or motherless, but it could lead to, it can kind of become a self-fulfilling prophecy in, in a sense, because you took away the, the parent. And so now we have a child who's maybe more likely to, to repeat that cycle. So, so talk a little bit about the vision for that you have for children of those who are incarcerated. Yeah, what we have there is what we, what we call the Angel Tree Program. And that's designed to give a, a, a Christmas gift, the gospel, and link the uh, family of the incarcerated um, to um, through a local church or a celebrate recovery that's doing angel tree. Um, but, but that gives them the link. And what happens is the, um, the, in the actual, uh, incarcerated person will, um, fill out an application, you know, listing the name of the child, but also, um, give information on, you know, what they think they might want, want to receive. And that gift actually is shown to come from that person instead of a, an outsider. So it's really a, it's kind of an extension gift from the in, inside, in, the inmate to the family, to the kids. Angel tree. So if a church was watching this and they were interested in, in participating, they could sign up to become an angel tree partner. Is that how it works? Correct. Yeah. Go to the same website, prisonfellowship.org. Click on Angel Tree, and it'll provide all the information for you to sign up right online. Okay. I think the numbers, um, Deaton, last year were around 320,000 kids that were uh, serviced with, uh, that were given gifts um, from their mom or dads that are incarcerated. Wow. So one thing we like to emphasize, it does start with Christmas. It starts with the incarcerated parent filling out an application 
which is really starting to begin now inside prisons. We usually have applications between May and August um, going out so we can service as many parents as we can. But it starts with the gift at Christmas, but it's really designed to be a year round program where we're working with the, um, the children after we've serviced them with the gift to really help strengthen the relationship between the mother or the father and the child and their family. And so some of the things that we do to encourage that relationship or keep that child strong, because you did ask about the whole, the whole cycle of parents being incarcerated and then you have a child that's incarcerated is our programs that happen like our sports camps and our, um, our um, other camps that we have that we can send these children to so that they can get informed about how it is to be, to look and act differently, but also introduce them to Christ. They may have never been introduced to Christ before. And, and we all know that um, when we have Christ in our life, things change dramatically for us because of his unconditional love. So it's one process. It starts with the gift, but it's so much more than that. It's really about restoring this child in every way we can and strengthening their family. That's beautiful. It, it, restoration is such a powerful <laughs> thing. Uh, I mean, and it's it, it's something that when you see it, it's beautiful. Talk a little bit about the the work that is done with wardens. I was reading a little bit about that there's some kind of a partnership program or something that goes on where you guys are actually working with the wardens. Is that is that true? Yeah. yeah, it's called the Warden Exchange, um, and that, um, I'm not too, I mean, I don't work directly with that department or with that group, but um, what they do is their wardens and superintendents get together um, as a group, they register as a group, and I think it's for a, for a complete year, where they go through um, actual programming training, and then just kind of working together of like sharing what's working in their facilities versus what's not working. And, and they, and they share those experiences together uh, to help them be uh, better at rehabilitation and, and transformation. Uh, and so it's one of our stronger programs and it's, it's, I'm not sure how long ago it started, but um, it's, it's a very active uh, uh, organization now that uh, we have quite a few uh, wardens that have been through it and uh, the list is always long and uh, for the current year of registrations to get involved. Wow. Yeah, so there we have two, the Warden's Exchange has two facets. They have an in-person, um, one that they can go to and they meet, um, they meet quarterly, or they also have, and that goes for 12 months. And then there's an also an additional one where they can do it online and it goes for nine months. So we offer it two different ways. Obviously, the online one's been much more popular since the pandemic. <laughs> right. um, but uh, I think we have four or five wardens from the state of California going through it right now. Wow. Do you guys have any idea how many lives, you, you know, prison fellowship impacts between those incarcerated, the families? Do you have any statistics on that? Like in a given year, do you know? Mm, it's um, well, one statistic I can give you, and it's kind of a, it happened through COVID since the onset of COVID, and actually Audrey and, and I were, were totally involved in what we now call floodlight. Um, uh, California Department of Corrections um, had asked uh, Audrey um, to, when, when COVID came, came down, um, they pretty much locked down the facilities. So they had no access to go to classes anymore or in, in, you know, in, in person classes. So they came to us and said, hey, is there a way you could provide digital content uh, that can be piped through their TV systems um, to the um, incarcerated? And um, so we came up in a very short time, actually, I think it was like 11 weeks, uh, we came up with a, 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 what's now called floodlight where we, we, uh, I reached out to the external partners that we had for curriculum partners in the academy and started getting receiving uh, digital uh, videos and um, applications that we could download and have access, give CDCR access to uh, in, uh, in California. And we set that up and it, and it just took off 
Um, so we felt, well, why limit it to um, just California? So we opened it up for the United States. And right now there's 48 states using floodlight, um, uh, about 380 institutions, and it's hitting about almost 600,000 um, inmate viewers are viewing all the materials that are on there. And it's, wow. it's, it's everything from core, core curriculum that we were using in our academies to uh, movies, to um, sports figures and interviews and podcasts. Uh, and, and a lot of different um, artists that um, put together programs that we um, videotaped and put on that they can download and access. So that's that, fantastic. That's, yeah, and that number, I mean, th that's that's over a half a million, but to I'm not sure what the number is, you know, that we touch every year, but I'm sure it's a lot. Yeah. And for those people that, aren't, that, that don't know, I'm just assuming people do, but I, I shouldn't do that. Um, this, everything we're talking about here, this was all born out of Chuck Colson, who was a transformed man, uh, famously went to prison after the Watergate situation and became a transformed person. And it was, it was his experience in prison. That is the reason you guys are sitting here and we're talking about this right now, that, that, that in itself, talk about a redemptive story. Um, yes. In fact, I'm, I'm sitting in my office. I'm looking at a book on my bookshelf by Chuck Colson right over there. Um, but talk about a redemptive story just by itself, that here's a guy that Chuck Colson was a, uh, how should I say this, hard charger uh, mm -hmm. in his early political years before he knew God, and then goes to prison after Watergate, becomes a transformed person and founds prison fellowship. And here you guys are now touching millions of lives what a what a story um and and you know i i was reading it in your material today but it, sometimes i think we can forget you know we, we you know i think a lot of people of faith are thinking about how they can you know feed people or you know clothe people or uh, you know care for people that, that that are just among us here but it's but we can't forget about. I think it's the sixth category or whatever to fit five, five or five out of five or six out of the sixth category is remember those in prison. Mm -hmm. um, so easy to forget, and you guys are helping us not to forget. So we appreciate it. Thank you guys for what you do. Thank you, Thank you. for having us. Thanks and for, for people us. who are interested in supporting Prison Fellowship, I encourage you to look them up. Prison Fellowship is the ministry founded by Chuck Colson. In 1976, they do great work uh, all around the country uh, in lots of prisons, touching lots of lives. So we appreciate it. Thank you, guys. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next thank time. You. Thank you. Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you've joined us today, wherever you are. Uh, we'll, I want to remind you, you can watch all the interviews uh, for Good Life on goodlifetelevision.org. You can also follow us on all the social media platforms, and we'd love to see you there. Goodlifetelevision.org. Uh, special guest today is Nathaniel Curran is with me. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Nathaniel is the global team manager for Channel Island Surfboards, and he's also the co-founder of the Young and Brave Foundation, which we're going to talk about um, in a little bit. But um, last night I was reading your story, and it's really it was fun to read and and cool. Um, so let's go back to 2000, I guess seven. Yeah. So you're you're a surfer. Yep. You have a sponsor, three year sponsor. You hurt your shoulder. Yeah, it was the it was the third time I've I dislocated my shoulder. And, uh, surfing? I mean, sur uh, yeah, the first time was basketball. The second two times were uh, surfing. Um, so that the first one was at 18, and then the last one was at like 25, I think it was. Okay. So, so when you when you hurt your shoulder, your sponsor just dropped you. At the uh, time. Yeah, I think they gave me like maybe a month or two, and then yeah, let me go. So I just bought a house, just had a new car, um, and they kind of just terminated my contract. So. And so you're left with an injured shoulder. You have to sell everything. Yep. And then you 
your family made a decision or your, you kind of got together with your family to say? Yeah, it was my, my you know, we have a close family and my both my brothers were professional surfers. And um, I mean, my goal was to make the world tour. And um, uh, and so they, they came to me and like, what, what do you think? And and we think you should, you know, sell everything. And, you know, my mom was like, OK, well, you have one year um, to make the tour, you know, like just pretend this is your college and you're work I pretty much credit carded everything for a year and uh, yeah ended up having the best year uh, of my life that year okay so how does it work the tour how do you make the tour and, and I want to talk about the event that you won yep. in Huntington Beach in 2008 but what would just by way of process how does this work for a professional surfer I don't know yeah so there's the it's changed a little bit now but uh, when I was doing it it was the world qualifying series so that was everyone trying to qualify to make the world uh, championship tour, which is uh, the top 32 in the world. When I was there, it was the 44 in the world. So every year, like 16 people fall off the championship tour, and then the, the qualifying tour, those 16 people in the top would go, go on, on. The, the next year. Ah. So, and you know, there's you know, 500 to 600 people globally that are competing. competing and so, you know, to get in that top 16 is really, really tough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like the years before leading up to it, I think I got into the like the 30s to 40s, but never broke that. 16. Uh, 16. Okay. Yeah. So then you go to Huntington Beach, July of 2008. Yep. What happens? So, well, leading up to that, I had, I had a couple good results, you know, because they take your best, um, was it six or eight events through the year? Okay. And they're, they're stars. So like six star would be the highest events. One star would be the lowest. Okay. So you want to do the six stars. Yeah. So leading up to it, I had a couple good results and then come into the U.S. Open, like kind of hometown for us in California. Yeah. Our big event. I watched my brother, um, Tim, make the final like three times, two or three times and never win. And so just growing up, watching my brother, I always wanted to win that one event. That's you right. know, watching Kelly Slater, Tom Curran, yeah. Rob Machado. Um, so we get to uh, August and um, I ended up having an amazing event. I stayed at my friend Brett Simpson house that year and he made the semis and then I ended up winning the US Open in 2008. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Does that mean you're number one in the world for that moment? or So, no, that would be, um, I guess you would say at the time I'd be uh, 45th in the world because if you're counting the world championship tour. Okay. But that ended up putting me into number one on the world qualifying series. And then the next event was Japan was a six-star. I got fifth. I flew straight from there to France, and I won the France Lacanau Pro, which was a six-star. And then... Uh, Hossiger was another six star. I got fifth. Wow. Yeah. So that was like in a month. I, yeah. And you're on one surfboard. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, on one surfboard. Yeah. My favorite board. How does this, like, do you get, I mean, in basketball, if you're like hitting threes, you know, you're in the zone. Yeah. It, were you in the zone for a month? How does this work? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, obviously training and um, just surfing so much in contests for so many years. I, I just felt like I kind of just clicked into the zone, and uh, I was working. Uh, you know, my brother watches me a lot. My middle brother Josh, and he was videotaping my heats on his camera off the screen that they were recording on like a live stream. Yeah. And then when I when I would come home, we'd go over it, and he'd be like, "Look, this is what you're doing wrong. This is what this guy did." And so just having my family involved and helping me, just like it, everything clicked. I was so focused. I remember like being at the US Open, I would put a towel over my head, like in between heats, and I just, I don't know, it just, people were talking to me, things were going in, but You're I just was so in. focused on yeah. what I wanted to do, and I and, it, and the motivation, because I lost my sponsors and all that. Right, you had a little. Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, and that, you know, that's a good thing. Yeah, and the, and having a, a good surfboard, like I had, a, they always talk about a magic surfboard, and, um, you know, luckily I wore, worked closely with Channel Island surfboards and just the, the surfboard was amazing. Just, it was effortless and I didn't have to think about anything. Wow. So. And then that year you make a pretty good chunk of money and yeah. then you ended up getting sponsored and 
Yeah. And your life changed. Yeah, for sure. In that month. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was great. Yeah, I uh, ended up making, I think I made close to $80,000 on that one surfboard or something That's like unbelievable. that. unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. If somebody wants to get into this, how do they do it? Um, if, somebody, if a young person wants to try to compete in yeah. surfing, how do they do that? Yeah, well, me and all my brothers, we started at the NSSA contest here locally, and they run up and down California. Um, they have events pretty much every weekend. Um, so I would say, you know, look up uh, the NSSA. NSSA. Yeah, it's the National Scholastic Surfing Association. Okay, so that's <laughs> like the little league for yeah. surfing. Yeah, so they, they do it until you're, normally you do those until you're like 16 to 18. And then at 18, I turned pro and left and started doing, when I was like 16, I started doing little pro contests like the one stars and stuff. Wow. Yeah. How so, cool. Yeah. So my last question may be about surfing, but <laughs> do you ever, are you afraid of sharks? Uh, I am. Yeah, I think, I mean. Do you see them? Uh, I've seen little ones. I've never been, I mean, is there any wood around? Not kind of but, wood. Yeah. Um, I've never, I've never been scared like where I saw one, I'm like, I'm gonna get eaten, you know? But I've seen little ones and been like, okay, maybe I'll go go in or or get, I swear in, in the water, sometimes you'll just get a weird feeling or a weird smell and I'll just be like, nah, I'm just gonna go in, yeah. you know? So I don't know, I think everyone is afraid of sharks, but yeah. you know, it's like, I mean, that's people get into cars every day and people right. die in cars and right. you know, it's like, yeah. so. I don't know. Probably not a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, before we get to the Young and Brave Foundation, you work with Channel Islands Surfboards today. Yep. What, what is your global team leader? What does that mean? So I kind of uh, take care of all the athletes, uh, you know, mainly the top athletes uh, that are on our team that are on the championship tour. Okay. So I look after them to make sure all their boards are ordered, shaped, done, and delivered to where wherever they need to be okay. or like sometimes I'm bringing boards to them you know I'm going to an event and I'm gonna bring boards to them okay um, and working with the shaper and and working with their dimensions to make sure everything's right and there's there's so many you know technical things that go into a surfboard so yeah um, just and like for different waves you know Hawaii they need a whole nother kind of quiver really? of boards yeah so based yeah. on the location, location the and, and waves for really? sure. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so you so you work with like the the, the athletes that Channel Islands sponsors. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I, I take care of all those guys and I work closely with uh, Britt Merrick, who's our lead shaper, and right. um, we have uh, three other uh, team shapers. Wow. So, yeah. And if people want to watch, like let's say locally on the California Central Coast, yep. where can they find information about events to go support? Yeah, they can go on the, the uh, WSL, WSL. WSL. Yeah, that's the World Surfing League. Okay. And uh, they can log on and if there's events, I mean, some normally, during normal times, right. there's you know an event once or twice a month and they're live, so people can just watch. Uh, you can watch online? Yeah. Oh, really? I mean, I think surfing was, like one of the big um, front runners of uh, webcast live uh, sports. Like they've been doing it for a long time. We, like we used to watch when my brother was competing, it would just, we would watch, uh, it would be their name and then we scores would just pop up. You weren't watching anything but a screen. Oh really? Yeah, and, and then we'd be like, yeah, like, and you didn't <laughs> even see anything, you just saw a score, score. pop up. Wow. Uh, <laughs> what is it about surfing? It, se it seems like, for a lot of people that I know that are into surfing, it's almost like a therapeutic thing. Yeah. To be in the, is that true? Been true for you? Ah, uh, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think it's, I think it's so weird. It's it's something about the salt water. I think it's about leaving all your phone, right? All your stuff, like on the beach and like going in the water. No one can just hit you up. I need this. I need that. It's just like you in the ocean and normally a few friends. Yeah. And I don't know, it's just something that you're just away from everything. Yeah. So I don't, I mean, I guess you can go on hikes and stuff, but just, I think the ocean and the salt water are something different. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, you know, the power of nature. I mean, and you probably see it. I mean, with the, some of the waves, yeah. I'm sure you've surfed. It's amazing to me, like the, the, uh, 
the size, the scope yeah. of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Of the, you know, <laughs> like it, it's a, it's a perspective checker in a sense. Yeah. That we're pretty small. Yeah. I mean, kind of. Oh yeah. I yeah. Mean, I mean, and and Hawaii and um, uh, me and my brothers never really like did the like Mavericks that whole thing. We were more like more competitive surfers and and. Uh, I mean, those guys are crazy. Me and my brother both have asthma, so oh, <laughs> that was a little a, a little idea. factor. Yeah. Uh, you know, we serve big ways, but but there's uh, some people that yeah. What did you say about Mavericks? Yeah, Mavericks is up in uh, just above Santa Cruz, Northern California, and that's where the huge yeah yeah they have big like big wave contests, and those guys are uh, they're insane, and those guys train hard and. And uh, those guys are gnarly. They they have something that I I don't have. I don't know, or or lacking something. I don't know. <laughs> One of the two. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I mean, the latter. But, but yeah, yeah, those guys and girls, man, are charging. That's incredible. Huge waves. That's incredible. Well, that's fascinating. I want to sh- I want to transition into the, the Young and Brave Foundation, and I want I, I love you to tell the story, but just by way of introduction. So the Young and Brave Foundation. Um, 501c3 since 2011 yep. uh, with the vision of helping young adults and children diagnosed with cancer. Yep. This came out of an experience that you had or your family had. Yep. Tell us about kind of what happened and then how it became what it is. Yeah. Um, in 2009, uh, actually, my ex-girlfriend got diagnosed with leukemia. And uh, so it instantly changed my life forever. Like just knowing that someone you, you love can be gone in a second, you know, like, right. especially when you're at a young age, you're not like thinking about death as much, yeah. you know? Like, right. And it was just uh, something that um, I guess like I spent a week with her at the hospital and I was just like, man, there's, um, this is so gnarly that someone can be taken from you. So. You know, obviously, I got with a couple friends, and you know, our community were like, "Hey, let's start a nonprofit." And obviously, we started because of her, and uh, we ended up raising like a bunch of money for. Her, and everyone was kind of like, "Oh, I love the I love the name, um, Young and Brave." And and so I really wanted um, to obviously number one is like take take care of um, her and financial and all that stuff. She had no insurance. She had no insurance at the time, so yeah. it was pretty gnarly. Um, and then also down the line, we wanted to create uh, a nonprofit that was like a cool brand yeah, as well. Right. That I just didn't feel like there was anyone at that time that had like a brand of a nonprofit that was, I don't mean to cool. say cool, but right. you know, yeah. like just like made cool stuff and that you could wear and you were like stoked to support it. And yeah. so in, in our sphere of, uh, uh, I guess, surf community kind of thing yeah so um so yeah that's how that's how it started and 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 you've raised a lot of money yeah i mean yeah she was the first one and and she's doing good she's she's, she's married and she's got three kids really? yeah three daughters so she recovered. So, yeah oh, yeah she's doing wonderful. good so. and so you 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 kind of latch on with a family and then you help support them yeah so we them. we get uh I would say our our uh, foundation is like a, you go onto our website and we're we're like a platform, like kind of like a GoFundMe kind of thing. Okay. And so we get connected with families different ways through social media, through just a family, a friend, and so we put them on our our website. And then what is cool, we just actually link their PayPal to their site. So now if you go to donate, it goes directly to them. It doesn't even go through us. Oh, if they go to your site yeah. and donate and they, to a family, it goes to straight a, to them. Yes. Wow. Yeah, because we felt like um, the, with the nonprofit world, there's a lot of restrictions that you can and can't do. Right. You know? Right. Um, so we found that it was best if the money just went directly to them. Wow. And there's so many families that, uh, you know, one of the parents has to quit their job to take yeah. care of the kid yeah. or stay at home, um, parking at the hospital. There's so many hitting costs that people don't think about that we're like, hey, we just want this money to go to them to spend however they need need to. Yeah. You know? wow. So yeah, it's been eleven years and we've a uh, million dollars has gone through our website to Warriors. That's and that's so people donating directly to them. Wow. Which is pretty cool. And people so 
you have gear. Yep. So if people want to support Young and Brave, yep. they can either donate or they could buy gear. Yeah. Cool gear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is your website? This so it's the youngandbrave.com. Youngandbrave.com. Dot com. Youngandbrave.com. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. So if, so, so if somebody's watching this and they know of a family that has a situation with a yep. kid, they can they can log on and 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 it will you can click on support a warrior and it will take them to a thing to fill out all their information to sign up to become we call them our warriors um, to become a warrior and so then they're featured on your website yep. that way yeah and then we would connect their paypal and then wow. anyone that wants to donate could help that family it's amazing how you know tough stuff like this can change your life yeah i mean so here you, you know, you have a, an ex-girlfriend yeah. who all of a sudden has this diagnosis. Yeah. How has it changed, how has this road and then Young and Brave happens and how has all of this changed your perspective in your life? Oh, whew. Um, for sure. It's, I think it's, it's changed my life in the way of like, um, we all get caught up in so much stuff in life of like, just, we need this, I need this, yeah. give me this. Um, and or I'm in a hurry, blah, blah, blah. And it's, sometimes it's just, I always try to like step back and go, man, that's like, uh, I know families that are dealing with their little kid that has cancer. Like, right. you don't have, I don't have, I don't have that kind of problem. So it's, <laughs> right. it's really been an eye opener for me to like, kind of just stand back and go, Hey, I'm fine. My family's healthy. Yeah. You know, like let's, let's figure this out. Perspective. You know? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So, and I want, I wanted to create an avenue for kids. You know, I grew up in the surf industry and I want to be sponsored. I want free stuff. I need this. And it's like everyone wants, 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 wants. But I wanted to create something that kids could get behind and go, hey, I want to give back. Yeah. I want to help someone and show them. And like, I want to give them an avenue to give back. Yeah. So it's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. And you want you're going to keep this going. I mean, Young and Brave is here. I mean, you're going to you want to keep this going. Yeah, I, I recently my my middle brother um, jumped on board and helps me. My middle brother Josh, and he's kind of helping. He's been a great help with the website and just dialing everything in for us. And um, and we have a great uh, board right now with just some amazing people that have helped us and kind of geared us in the last few years. So wow. it's just, it's been a cool, cool And is Channel Islands at all involved in the? Um, yeah, they help donate and stuff. And oh, they do? Yeah. And so. Do you have any events or anything? Yeah, we, normally our Maybe events right would, be, now, but... would be posted on our website. Um, <laughs> but we're actually, the only event we can do right now is the, we have a golf tournament that we're doing in two oh. weeks. Oh, really? And, uh, Here? In at in uh, Camarillo in, at Spanish Hills Country Club. Oh, nice! So that's our annual one. This is it will be our seventh seventh year doing it there, and that's kind of a big turnout. And we can do it because it's outside and yeah, you know, right. Um, and surfing is okay now. What are the rules? Yes, surfing's okay at at, at this time. Um, I, it's crazy. Surf and golf. That's what I love. And You're right good. now, it's everyone's doing it. I right. mean, <laughs> surfboards are flying off the rack because no one can go on a trip, right. you know, or they're just staying home and. Um, and golf. It's hard to get a tee time right now. Yeah. <laughs> Where, how do people buy Channel Island surfboards? What's the best way to buy a surfboard from Channel Islands? Uh, well, we have a store in Santa Barbara on State Street. Okay. I think it's on Anacapa. Um, and they have an awesome store with hundreds of boards and clothes and gear. And, uh, and if they're not local, they can buy uh, boards online. Channel Islands. Channel Islands. Uh, it's, I think it's cisurfboards.com. CISurfboards.com. Yeah, and you can go on and you can actually custom build your own board. You can put on uh, where you want your logos of the CI. Really? You can like put different airbrushes, different tails. Yeah. Wow. It's really cool. That's kind of cool. Yeah. We need a good life surfboard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get you one. Done. <laughs> done. Um, do you train young surfers? Um, I've done a little bit of coaching, um, but I've kind of just always had a lot going on like the foundation the like job it. yeah um yeah. i always have some yeah. new my wife always gets mad at me she's like oh yeah you're starting a new company okay yeah <laughs> so um right now it's the That's foundation and and work at ci so 15 years as a professional surfer on the asp world tour and then young and brave foundation is young and yep nathaniel curran it's a pleasure to meet you me too uh, you're quite a guy thanks for coming <laughs> on good life 
Thank you. We'll see you next time.